Thank so you. I want to support, uh, say one thing, supporting that. I have two sort of points on the special interest one. One, I, I think it is correct that labor unions don't own enough shares, so they'll, they'll have to get the fidelities in the private sector of the world to support their nominees um, uh, in some sense. So that would counter it. I guess the only sort of counter that would be is unless we think risk metrics that gives a lot of advice to the mutual funds and the, the private holders is going to have some, is not going to be looking at objectively who the nominees are. And if they do, then that might uh, not be as a big an issue, though. I, 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 was, to, uh, um, I was talking with someone from Ms. Risk Metrics was saying actually institutional investors, or the, if you look at them, have very different views about proxy access. And in fact, I think what they thought might happen is the hedge funds and those investors are not going to want to use proxy access. And it's a technical reason, so maybe the SEC could change the rule is, but under proxy access, your names are on the same as management's proxy. And that's what gets sent out, sent out. Whereas a normal proxy fight, you have your own cards, you send them out, you can see who's getting, you get them back, you can see what subsets what's going on. And so they're not going to want to use the proxy access mechanism. Because they're going to want to use their own cards and like, and that may mean that Whatever, whether it's true or not, the perception may end up being that it's only special interest because the people who are going to use it will be the unions and the public pension funds, at least at the outset. Hedge funds won't use it, and the fidelities and those people of the world, they're not in a culture where they're interested in being adversarial to management and putting something up. So it would be very surprising if T. Rowe Price or those people actually used proxy asset at the outset because uh, they like working, as you were saying, behind the back door. And so whether or not it's true that, it's, that their, their nominees are special interests, it may look like that because they'll be the ones using it. And I suppose the other issue to point in is a technical point. The old 2003 version of proxy access said that the nominee had to be independent of the nominator. The current, and, and now one could debate whether that's a good or a bad thing, the current version got rid of that requirement, and so the person being nominated can be associated with the nominee. Although I still think if you put up someone too associated with you, like, you know, let's say the AFL CIO puts up Damon Silvers, you know, unless people, you know, they, he might be thought of as objective, then he'll get votes, but if he isn't, he won't get the vote. So I don't know how important that is, but that is a distinction in, in the proposal. Be, yeah. Before you respond to that, let me just, uh, because you've started in on, on my second subject, which is I, I think the audience might want to know, I know I want to know, uh, your opinions as to what is the, the best and the worst uh, among the provisions in the currently pending legislation. And, and go ahead, and uh, if you could weave that into your answer, I think <laughs> I would. Well, that's a, a, it's a bit difficult, because there are, tw I mean, I, I went through a newsletter that came in yesterday which listed the 12 provisions, um, and, and not all of them are necessarily creating new um, changes but sort of facilitating it. I mean, for example, proxy access is a major issue right now and the SEC is having a rulemaking on it. There's a provision in the legislation which says write a rule. Um, what that will do is uh, provide legal cover so there will not be litigation over the SEC's authority to adopt such a rule, um, but that would not necessarily be empowering. Um, say on pay, votes on golden parachutes. Um, I think a lot of these are already in the train uh, you know, I, I have advocated or had clients advocate most of the items that are in the bill, at least the subject matter. Um, so it's all right. Was there anything you 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 don't like in there? As a policy matter, or is there, or is a subject for legislation? Either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as a policy matter, there are, I mean, there are nits that I could pick with with most of the provisions. But and for the most part, I think that they're, you know, that the policies are good, whether they would need federal Right. I, I have a feeling your, your co-panelists will, will, will find fault with some right. of them. Professor Bain? Yeah, they'll do the worst parts. Um, <laughs> we'll put a negative sign in front of what I just said. You know, we've heard a lot on this panel about lack of democracy and this little elite in Delaware, cabal you know, in Wilmington, um, setting global corporate governance. When I look at the provisions in these bills, I'm reminded of the fact that uh, this is Chris Dodd uh, who's writing one of these bills, who wrote a lot of the legislation that created the framework for the financial crisis of 2008. This is Chris Dodd of Countrywide VIP Program. Uh, this is, um, you know, the Congress that Barney Frank, who was Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's guardian angel for two decades on Capitol Hill and prevented any meaningful reform uh, of those institutions. Um, you know, these are 
for the most part, the people that got us into this mess. Um, and I don't trust them. Well, let, let me just no, no, let me, let me finish. finish. Okay. I, I, no, let well, me I mean, finish. The, it, go ahead. I don't trust the people that are writing this legislation as far as I could throw them. And I'm not in that great shape. Um, <laughs> and I much more trust the people that are writing Delaware corporate law. And, and so I look at these provisions and I say, you know, I don't think any of these provisions are good ideas. I think mandating them so that every publicly held company in the country has to have them is an awful idea. And I think letting these people that got us into this mess in the first place be the ones to throw together this hodgepodge of half-baked ideas that have been kicking around um, for 20 years is probably the worst idea I've seen in the 20 odd years I've been an academic. All right, but if this, if this were an oral ar argument in our court, the, the next question to you would be, okay, you've told us why your adversary is a bad guy, but you haven't told us why he's wrong. So I'm asking, I'm asking you to point to well, he's specifics wrong. in the pending legislation that you there, think is Ill, are ill-advised. Anything that fundamentally empowers shareholders over and above where they are now, and the reason I say that is that um, again, we come back to this idea of board centrism and the idea that having, um, uh, there, there are basically two ways you can organize economic decision making within firms. One is sort of consensus where everybody gets a vote, everybody has input, and the other is authority where there's some central decision maker who um, uh, is empowered to make decisions that are binding on the organization as a whole. Uh, consensus does not work where you have uh, stakeholders with differing interests, differing access to information, and where you have stakeholders whose decision-making processes are going to be fraught with collective action problems, i.e. shareholders, right? Um, and, and the reason that we don't have corporate democracy is precisely because um, you have to have a central decision-making body, i.e. the board of directors, that is small, that is cohesive, that has equal access to information, and that has similar interests. And that everything we do to empower shareholders comes at the expense of the board of directors authority. You cannot empower shareholders without limiting the authority of the board of directors. And at some point, the ability to hold people to account becomes the ability to decide. I use this example in class. Um, suppose that you all think that I need to be held accountable for how I'm teaching my class. So Dean Schill comes down and sits in the back of the room with a stack of money that's my pay for the month. And every time I do something Dean Schill doesn't like, he holds me accountable by taking some money off of my stack and putting it back in his stack. Well, pretty soon I'm teaching that class by keeping an eye on Dean Schill and making sure that he's leaving my stack alone. And I'm no longer making decisions. The reviewer is deciding how that class is going to be taught. Everything we do to empower shareholders comes at the expense of limiting the board of directors' authority. And that's going to make corporate decision making less efficient. It's going to make corporate decision making more cumbersome, more subject to special interests. Um, and so anything in this legislation that empowers shareholders at the expense of the board of directors is, I think, a very bad idea. Let's hear uh, Mr. Katz and Professor Romano. What uh, do you like or don't like about the pending legislation? I mean, uh, specifically. Specifically, um, I don't, frankly, I don't like any of the governance provisions at all, but if you ask me to rank them in order of, of, of le least liking to, to more like, something like shareholder advisory votes on say on pay, um, at the end of the day are not going to be very meaningful in, in my mind. That they will allow shareholders to express a view. Um, in the UK, they have not had that big an impact. Um, you know, I think a lot of that dialogue goes on already. Um, it may give a forum for that dialogue on, on executive comp, um, but I don't think that it, at the end of the day it's going to harm the system that much. Things, though, on the other end of the spectrum, like 
uh, some of the bills would mandate a separation of this chairman and the CEO. I think that, again, it, that's a one-size-fits-all model. Um, there's lots of different ways boards of directors work. Most boards of directors work pretty effectively, whether they have a, one guy who's the chairman and CEO, whether they have a non-exec chairman. Each, each company is, is, is different, and each, each has, has its impact. By mandating that, I think that we're going to be, be moving in the wrong direction. And, and um, you know, frankly, one of the difficulties of, of the shareholder-centric model is this whole push for quote unquote independent directors. Well, a lot of people look at independent directors as people that have not only no relationship, but when you really cut through it, not a lot of expertise with respect to that company either. So we've taken the people that have some expertise, the insiders, and taken them out of the boardroom with the exception of the CEO.